Thank you, my goodness. So I will be just uh, reviewing all the cardiovascular outcome trials of various anti-diabetic agents. Now, this is the algorithm of uh, treatment algorithm prescribed by American Diabetic Association, uh, which is the latest. It says that they start off with uh, metformin, lifestyle and then metformin. Then if it is not controlled, then you go for, you rule out atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease or kidney function, CKD. And if this is right, then these patients have to go for GLP-1 receptor antagonist or HGLP-2 inhibitors. And if there is CKD that predominates, then you go for HGLP-2 inhibitors along with metformin. And if it is no, then you go to the others. The irony is that, you know, uh, sulfonylureas, Thysolidinions, insulins have all gone down to the last, that's the last result. Very unlike uh, to uh, what is being uh, every day we all practice, and all of us are very comfortable about prescribing metformin, and then prescribe along with that as sulfonylurea, and we are comfortable and we are able to control our patients' diabetes normally, and at most of the times. So this, this recommendation has got yeah, different implications uh, for American population, which we will, which I will also have a look at, uh, comparing what the guideline says and what the real world practice is. So we will see all that. But this is the recommendation. So the idea of uh, doing this exercise is to see uh, the gather of uh, studies that are conducted with various uh, anti-diabetic agents and then see where do all these things lead to. As we all know, cardiovascular disease itself is a, I mean, diabetes itself is a cardiovascular disease. Highly, it, it increases the propensity for cardiovascular disease. Sometimes it's called diabetes itself is a cardiovascular disease, right? So, at the moment you have diabetes, you are already having an endothelial dysfunction, therefore, there is uh, a cardiovascular disease set in. So, there are views, but then the point is very clear that uh, coronary heart disease, you know, there is a heart ratio of uh, two times, right? And coronary death is little more than two. It very clearly shows that both uh, coronary artery disease as well as the neurovascular uh, complications are extremely high in patients with diabetes. All of us know that diabetes is a disease that affects the vasculature to both macrovascular and microvascular uh, complications are uh, very high in diabetes. Now, uh, the, the C word, which is a popular term nowadays, uh, uh, is being used to describe all the cardiovascular outcome trials. The reason why this cardiovascular outcome trials became as a norm for evaluating cardiovascular, I mean, anti-diabetic agents is something which I will now uh, give a brief. 2008 uh, guidance made it mandatory for all the anti-hyperglycemic agents to go for their cardiovascular safety studies. It is all because of the approval of uh, PIPA, gamma, you know, we have this 5-glitazone. So it started with, you know, the rosiglitazone, 5-glitazone issue, right? And uh, rosiglitazone had first initially shown that there is an increased cardiovascular problem. And then 5-glitazone also was later on implicated into that. Therefore, finally, there is a lot of questions that are we lose, gaining something in the straight and losing in the bend, right? Therefore, the question was that, you know, whatever being said and done, any cardiovascular, any anti-diabetic agent should prove, like statins, statins should prove mortality benefits. So the same way an anti-diabetic agent should prove that it is at least not harmful to the heart. So they said at least prove that it is not worse than placebo. That's the 
uh, guidance of American Diabetic Association, American FDA. With that, this cardiovascular outcome trial started. So the focus is to show non-inferiority. That means it is at least as good as that of placebo. You have a standard of care medicine and then you add, let us say, glyphosin or you add a gluten to it into one group of patients and another group of patients take the same standard of care along with the placebo. The placebo group and the drug treated group at least it should be equal in terms of cardiovascular uh, outcomes and that is non-inferiority. So you should show at least a non-inferiority uh, as a point and you should uh, typically have a clear cut primary endpoint of saying composite cardiovascular death, non-fatal MI and non-fatal stroke. These are all some of the clear endpoints one should have. So this is how this cardiovascular study started and then they defined what is non-inferiority and what is superiority. Supposing the cardiovascular effects are lower than 1 as compared to the placebo, it is superior and if it is higher than 1.3, it is inferior. So that is how the definition was given. And just to give you a timeline of some of the major, major diabetes studies, it started with the DCCT, right, which is the landmark which gave us an idea of the need for tighter control of glycemia. And then the UK PDS and then various studies have come. And this is the time, the 2008 is the time where the guidelines for COT trials came. And after that, all of the studies, most of the studies are done with uh, cardiovascular outcome as the measure. There are a number of uh, studies and all the studies that are now being done are all related to cardiovascular safety. So you have DPP-4 studies, the, all the blue one are all DPP-4, the gliptin studies, right? Uh, this is uh, saxagliptin, alagliptin, citagliptin, right? And uh, various gliptins and then glyphosins. Right. This is the GLP-1 uh, receptor antagonist and this is the SGLT-2 receptor uh, inhibitors and the basal insulin. So these are the various compounds that were taken for measuring the cardiovascular outcomes. Right. This is uh, overall the studies that are completed, close to about 18 studies that are completed studies and close to about 22 studies are going on right, with the studies under progress. These are all studies under progress. Huge number of studies are under progress. The similarities between all these studies is that they are all large in number right, and all of them have taken um, an HPA1C entry level of between 6 to 7.5 around that and then they all have tried to um, try to work on a reduction in cardiovascular outcome primarily uh, those endpoints which are defined by the UPA. So now I just uh, explain the major cardiovascular outcomes in the COT studies. These are all the outcomes. Several study it was neutral the central point is neutral. Anything that comes on to the left positive, that means safer, the comforts are being safer. And if it had moved this way, it's not being shown safer. And most of them were neutral. Last week or last month or before I I reviewed the DPP4 inhibitors. And we were very clear that DPP4 inhibitors did not offer any cardiovascular advantage, but they were neutral, completely neutral. That means uh, neither was detrimental to the cardiovascular uh, mortality or morbidity, nor was any uh, giving any kind of advantage. 
big before prescribing the big before for a patient who has got an established cardiovascular disease didn't make much of a sense. That is what we reviewed in the last I think, two months before, right? Uh, in the in the whole uh, review, uh, I have just come to the clear points, you know, the conclusion points, which I want. I this is the kind of uh, conclusion point. When you look at the whole list of drugs that are studied, it's very important for us to have some kind of a clean. Uh, what is the one line? Uh, Citagliptin, hexanidine, saxagliptin. Linagliptin, lixisanatide, they are all cardiovascular neutral. They, they did not have any positive benefit nor had any detrimental benefit. They were neutral. But for one, saxagliptin did have a little bit of an increased hospitalization issue. So, for us to simply remember, you know, I just created an acronym, uh, sex life is neutral to heart, right? Citagliptin, hexanidine, as linagliptin, lixander, so, so I just said S, E, X, so sex life is neutral to heart, but too much X is not always. So just remember that, so you, you clearly know that these are, these are drugs which are okay and uh, when it is saxagliptin, be careful. Rest of it, neutral. In fact, uh, if you ask me, prescribing gliptin for a diabetic patient does not provide any form of economics, any kind of an economic sense. Because for half a point of uh, HbA1c reduction, I don't think uh, you have any, uh, that the cost and the benefit are uh, proportionate. The advantages are typically good for empaglifosin, canaglifosin, dapaglifosin, liraglutide, semaglutide, and albiglutide. These are very good. So um, it's easy to remember, just keep it as EC glyphosin. So empaglifosin, canaglifosin, if at all you have a patient who has an established atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, Epaglyphosin or canaglyphosin has a clean, straight record. Right? Other glyphosins, uh, uh, dapaglyphosin and all others are second in the line. Uh, shall one minute. Yeah. So, empaglyphosin and uh, canaglyphosin, you can keep remember it as a, um, you know, as, the, uh, as a kind of an acronym. EC glyphosin. So, when you when you want to choose a drug, you know, you can just say empagliposin or canaglyphosin. So you can, your choice is very clear. So when it comes to neutrality, you can just remember this citagliptin is the best. Exenetide if you are using DL, uh, the RA, but you know, we'll we'll discuss that later. In all these cases, watch out for the cost benefit. This is a very important thing. For an Indian context, uh, the way we are uh, increasing the cost of diabetic medications is uh, becoming uh, it's becoming like a white elephant, you know. We are just sort of our patient prescriptions, I mean prescription cost is uh, going up like uh, 30 times to 70 times as compared to what we need. We were prescribing in the 90s and, uh, and even if you adjust it for inflation, um, even then, you know, our prescription cost for a diabetic patient has become 40 to 50 times higher, right? So, which is, uh, uh, to a large extent, the uh, medical profession has to take responsibility for that. The, we are ex writing very, very expensive medicines. Uh, whether or not justified or not is something that we need to look at. So, the relevance to Indian market, pharmacoeconomics do not justify use of uh, DPP-4 at all. I am, in my opinion, glyptins are reasonably useless, right? There's no point uh, prescribing a DPP-4 inhibitor as a great drug of choice. If you first try Capos, Oglibos and uh, those kind of drugs, I know that uh, there will be some bit of an abdominal distension and things like that, but other people are all, you know, uh, uh, 
Indian people can live with those kind of abdominal side of the, you know, bit of uh, distension. Uh, we, we, we are not the typical the Western, uh, the high end population, you know, which, which has various, uh, those kind of things. So, I would rather look at uh, the cost benefit ratio. There's no justification to prescribe a BPP4 just because somebody has an abdominal platelets. When you prescribe canaligliptin, it doesn't mean that he has less platelets, right? So, the platelets is more of a habit uh, issue. So, uh, BPP4 doesn't uh, uh, fit into the pharmacoeconomics at all. SGMT2 has relevance, especially when the patient has got a cardiovascular respiratory cardiovascular established uh, condition. Uh, now, how do you establish whether the patient has got atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease? Established is a matter which the, whether if a general physician will be deciding or a general practitioner will decide or a cardiologist has to decide whether the patient is already on an atherosclerotic heart disease is something which needs to be debated. What do you call as atherosclerotic heart disease already established? Uh, if there is a patient with an S proven SKD heart disease, then there is no issue. That, that part is very clear. If somebody comes with a positive treatment, then you are no, you don't have to worry about all that. I mean, so, or somebody who carotid the uh, intimal artery thickness is very high, then you are, you are very clear that atherosclerotic heart disease is set, but then you know, in all our patients, you know, how do you decide whether atherosclerotic heart disease is set? And it's something that's a clinical decision, but then you know, that's something debatable also sometimes. So, SGLT2 do, do have a relevance, right? So, but you need to confine, you need to confirm and qualify such patients. Prescription for all suspected ACVD cases, I mean, ACVD cases are debatable. I mean, expecting somebody may have a cardiovascular disease and then prescribing a empagliflozin uh, or a canagliflozin is something not a great thing. Just because a pharmaceutical company is pushing uh, prescribing that is not a great thing. So we have to very clearly reserve it for those who are established with either a CKD or a atherosclerotic uh, cardiovascular disease. Uh, GLP-1 RA is are prohibitively expensive. I mean, uh, it's something unless the patient is really, really rich who can afford all these things. Uh, this is a very superfluous kind of a prescription. Right. And the patient should also have a reasonable refractory obesity, so then it works. So, uh, in an Indian context, uh, the we are not insured out of pocket expenses. Patients pay out of pockets. So, this is not going to be reimbursed by any insurance company. And you know, this kind of a cost of uh, you know just pushing that cost to the patient is uh, unjustified. Uh, that is in my opinion. So. Uh, the GLPRA recommendation by the American Diabetic Association is questionable as far as India is concerned. We have to literally re re rethink what is suited for us. Right? Uh, so this is not pretty uh, good. For us, of course, metformin is the first choice. We have no issue about it. Our own real, the real world experience studies have shown one thing. This glyphosate, MR and glimpred are absolutely good. Right? We, we sometimes, you know, because the pharmaceutical companies or somebody, whatever it is, you know, the number of new studies coming, so we, sh we forget to uh, use or we forget to sort of uh, uh, lay emphasis on this glycoside MR or glimpred. Uh, but uh, real world experience uh, has very clearly shown. Real world experience that is collected from the US uh, insurance data, where about 22 million patient data has been taken for over 25 years has shown that the primary sulfonylurea, the secondary sulfonylurea failure and all is all over exaggerated story. This, uh, you know, uh, the insulin depletion and things like that. Patients who take 25 years, 30 years of sulfonylurea and still respond. So, it's all over hyped. Somewhere there is a story going on that sulfonylurea is a fail, don't respond and things like that. There may be a need for those technicians, that's something which is acceptable. But, I mean, we are also getting sometimes carried away by that kind of story. So, relevance to Indian context as well as these new drugs are concerned, as well as the COT studies are concerned, what is very relevant to us is that 
glyphosates, especially MPA glyphosate and CAN glyphosate, do hold good if the patient has got a chronic kidney disease or an atherosclerotic, let us say a patient with CAD, coronary artery disease established, then those drugs do stand a chance to be prescribed if the patient can afford it, right? And not for all others. This is how finally this evolves, right? So having said that, I just wanted to say, okay, wanted to compare how the Americans have responded to all their guidelines because they give so much of guidelines the whole world goes gaga about American guidelines. So what happened to American guidelines? So three slides. There is a study which is a cascade study which got published about a week back. Right? The cascade study, they just wanted to see how these patients have improved glycemic control and the outcomes overall. From a period, they have they have taken a period from 2005 to 2016 in three blocks and wanted to see uh, between these blocks of time period have, has there been any kind of a great improved glycemic control. The results are disappointing. The results are that, that the, the, this is what it is. The diabetic cascade has not significantly improved since early 2000. Whatever that was there about 2020 years back, the same is the outcome. The reason the American government, the cascade study, authors have concluded on that affordability is an issue. The new drugs are too expensive. Reach and availability of these new drugs are difficult. Compliance to so many medicines are difficult. Patients are comfortable with the older medications, right? So it says a lot of things to us, right? So this has happened to the most developed world. Who is prescribing guidelines? And all over the world, we all go to American Diabetic Association, learn from them, and come and teach other physicians and uh, ask them to also prescribe and fall and do this. But uh, the reality is, that even in the US it's not a, uh, the truth, the real world is truth. So uh, the net net of it is there are two things that you have to look at. One is your evidence-based medicine which comes from randomized controlled studies. Another is real world data. The real world data comes from the insurance field because they have a record. Right? And when they do a retrospective study, they have not found any benefit out of glyphosates or DPP-4 or from your insulin, long-acting insulins uh, discovered by Novo or Lilly. They are comfortable with the old, uh, your uh, NPH insulins and things like that. Everything was equal, right? This is the reality. So, so you need to have a balanced view. So, with this I end. Um, that, that this is the, finally what they recommend is more frequent diabetic screening, expanded access to care and health insurance, interventions to improve diabetic patients' adherence to medication, reduced clinical inertia must remain strategies to improve diabetes outcomes, not new medications. So, these are all the old things that we have been taught. Dr. Sam G. P. Moses has taught to us, uh, Seshaya has taught to us, and uh, this is what we learned. This whole, whole four things, cardinal things, that continues to remain after 30 years. Right? We are now 30 or 40 years of, we have been hearing the same story. And 2019 also, the Americans endorsed what Sam G. P. Moses, Seshaya, Arihiran used to say. Right? So, um, we, we are back to square one and our roots are strong, right? Um, thank you very much. Well, Sampuna Luria reformer is good. The point is that I'll insulin. One strong point I want uh, us to rethink about the evidence. 
See, the evidence says physiologically pharmacology produced in the body are different from the evidences we create by our tracks. If you have a tuberculous meningitis or tuberculous proven infusion, it is a lymphocytic is that. It has been that centuries ago, it is that today. If you have got a growth pattern of a child in the womb of a mother, either your grandmother or a wife or a daughter, the pattern goes the same. Therefore, anything based on physiology and pharmacology, including our present specialty pharmacogenomics, are more stronger biological evidence than the evidence created by us in our tracks. This is one of the most important things we want every educated person to think for us. I am not saying those evidences are not to be there in the medical field. But even if you